afternoon. My name is Michael Broxton, and you're here for Introduction to Photojournalism, Getting Started. Um, welcome to those here in person, as well as those uh, watching online. Um, thank you to b &H Photo for inviting me to speak, and to Courtney Fields, who I dealt with, um, who, who invited me to speak here. So thank you. Just uh, full disclosure, I have no financial interest in anything I recommend or discuss. No one pays me to promote their product, sponsors me, or gives me free product, and b &H is not paying me. Opinions expressed on my own, for better and worse. Um, Questions. I love questions, so feel free to yell them out, you know, within reason. So I'm a photojournalist. I, I, I am most interested in politics and public policy, so I, uh, that's what I spend my time covering. Um, so just some examples, you know, I'm sure you recognize uh, the person here. Um, you may recognize our former UN ambassador. Um, you may have heard about the UN, uh, the uh, impeachment uh, hearings, um, uh, protest. Uh, a famous, now, a now very famous lawyer, and of course, as many protests, this one at the Capitol. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of our mayor, you know, for those in the area. So let's first talk about, the, let's, we're going to start from scratch. I'm going to assume you don't have any great experience with photojournalism. So let's just first talk about what are the types of, or the genres of photojournalism. First, you could, you could break them up into two categories, breaking news or spot news. And these are things, you know, fires, accidents, natural disasters. These are things you can't generally plan for. And then there's general news, which is basically everything else because you can sort of plan to cover whatever it is. And then going down further, mostly in the general news category, with one exception, um, sort of, is, uh, you could have people cover celebrities, red carpets, civic and cultural events, editorial, which is a catch-all for just about anything and there might be a news article about that they need photographs for. It could be cooking, it could be you, you name it. Um, you've seen pictures, human interest, pictorial, just cute images occasionally in news outlets because they're nice images. Obviously, politics and political events is going to be sort of the milieu that I'm going to be talking within. Um, sports, obviously, protests, rallies, war and conflict weather and I'm sure things I forgot. Now, I, the one exception to what I said is war and conflict usually isn't too planned, you know, what happens. But most of these others, you could say, I'm going to go out and shoot those things. So most things break down into either breaking or spot news or general news. Um, so what gets published? You're, you're starting out, you're trying to figure out what to shoot. First, they may not win Pulitzer Prizes, but very typical classic pictures, which we'll see in a little while, um, get Get, get published of just general things in un, not necessarily very imaginative ways. Certainly things that are different, you know, get published because they're different. Um, people sometimes have personal projects, you know, photographically, and they get published. Um, there are definitely photographers who shoot the same things that I do and many others, but they somehow have a unique style in doing it. Um, uh, angle, lighting, lenses, whatever it might be. Certainly you should think about shooting what interests you, because chances are you'll have more enthusiasm for it. And I don't know any of you, but you may have special, unique knowledge of a subject or interest or access to a subject that the average person would not have, I mean, which I don't know, but which might be the logical things for you to shoot if that's what interests you. Um, so you're not going to get rich. I'll just say that right up front, being a photojournalist. It follows the power, I mean, most of you, I mean, probably me, myself included. Um, it, it's a power curve, basically, or a long tail distribution, to be more technical. Um, a few people earn a, a good amount of money. Uh, most earn a middling amount, a middle amount of money, and plenty earn fairly small amount of money. And in May 2008, the Bureau of Labor Statistics for New York City found that the average photographer for all genres earned $50,000. And that actually, it's an interesting number in that when you looked at the numbers for different parts of the country, they're all odd numbers with significant digits. For some reason, New York rounded out to 50, so it's not just a made-up number on my, on my end. Um, so just, just as an aside, um, this kind of curve also is things like Amazon book sales. There's bestsellers, there's some who sell medium, and a lot that sell very small. So uh, don't, don't expect much financially. At least I hope you don't go, if you're going into this, uh, uh, if you think you're doing this for financial reasons, I should disabuse you of any great expectation. So what kind of employment can you get um, as a photojournalist? There's the classic staff photographer, fewer and fewer. Uh, are those positions around. Many of them have been eliminated in the last number of years. Um, and that's where you get like a W-2, you're on salary, you get benefits, that kind of stuff, full-time or possibly part-time. And then the most people are either freelance or independent. Um, and that could be where you'll shoot on spec, spec for, short for speculation. And that's where you go out and you shoot something. You then um, file it with whoever editor agency you work with. 
and uh, you hope that somebody uses it, and when they use it, you'll get a royal, a part of a royalty. It could be a cut of a cut, a cut of a cut of a cut, who knows? There's the classic paid assignment where um, some news outlet or entity will say, please cover this for us, and they will pay you so many dollars up front, maybe not pay you ahead of time, but they'll pay you so many dollars that you are guaranteed, maybe expenses if that's relevant. When, um, and then there's the other two versions, pitch and shoot, or shoot and pitch, I call it. Pitch would be, you have an idea, you know a, a publication or editor or an outlet that might be interested, and you contact them in some way and say, I have an idea for a story, a photo story, um, and I'd like to see if you're interested to have that shot uh, by me, et cetera. And the alternative is you can shoot the story or shoot part of the story or the, the, some initial photos and show that to an editor and say, here's what I shot and I think this would be interesting and or um, here's a few pictures and if you're interested, I can go further and then they would hire you for it. Um, then you want to know what happens to your pictures, who owns the rights to the photos. If you're a staff photographer, you know, regular salary, you know, regular employment, your, your employer owns all rights to the photos. It's called work for hire, um, and that's what it is. But on the other hand, you're getting a salary, you're getting benefits, which is hard to come by in this business. When you're freelancer independent, um, it can be either way. Um, if you're shooting on spec, it could, it could be exclusive or non-exclusive. Non-exclusive means that you can distribute the photos to multiple clients. Exclusive is you only can uh, distribute your photos from that shoot to that uh, place. Um, it's both ways. I've seen both. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, paid assignments are usually only exclusive because they're paying you uh, guaranteed money for shooting that. Now, you could say, well, gee, maybe these photos would be really great. I'm going to earn a lot more money if they were, if they went, if, they, if everybody can get them and not just the one place that's paying me. On average, you'll earn more money, probably a lot more money, by getting the promised uh, paid assignment rate when you to shoot that assignment, as opposed to hoping that you hit, hit it really big with an amazing shot. And for the pitch and shoot, shoot and pitch, it could vary. Um, it, it really could vary. Usually there's a contract involved, and you should read it carefully and verify your understanding if you don't get that. Because if, you, uh, if, if what you sign says it's exclusive and you violate that and distribute it to others, that's not going to bode well for you probably with that client and maybe others. Um, so people hear about things called photo agencies or wire services. These are things like Getty Images, Associated Press, Reuters, uh, AFP, EPA, Bloomberg, etc. And these, are, if you look at the credits, and photojournalists almost always look at photo credits in, on photos, you know, in news outlets they see, you'll see lots of other names b below them, and some of them could be Getty, Reuters, uh, or any of these, and, and plenty of others. Um, just to give you a sense of the business, Getty is by far the largest, possibly bigger than all the others. I don't really know the numbers, but they're, they're unambiguously in their own category. Uh, the second tier is probably this group of people, this group of agencies plus a few others, and then there's everyone else. Now, with these agencies, it varies, of course, what I'm going to say, but there are some agencies, they basically only take photos um, if they hire you to go out and shoot an, uh, an assignment. Some of these, you just on spec um, contribute your photos to, contribute's not the right word, file your photos with, and if they sell, if, if they get licensed by somebody, then you'll get a percentage of the licensing fee, um, et cetera. There's many in tier three, so I didn't try to list them, and truth be told, I'm pretty sure these are tier two, but I don't know any place to find an exact listing to find size, but I'm pretty sure that would work there, would be accurate. So what are the shots? You, you're going, you're covering an assignment. So I do political stuff. So politicians speaking at some place for some reason. So the three most widely, um, uh, used shots, and you should probably get these first if you can. You can't always if you can, because um, those are basically the insurance, the basic shots. So if nothing else, these are the, the not very imaginative, but the shot, the kind of shots that every, every that are widely used. Uh, it would be the medium, the cutaway or cuts, and the wide wide shot. So the cutaway or cuts is like a, a, a view from the side. Imagine Danny over here was taking a picture of me, and you get the audience, you'd get me, so you'd see me presenting, and you'd see you. Um, listening, hopefully, um, and that would sort of give a sense of the event and seeing both, as opposed to just a medium shot of me talking, or the wide, which might be from any angle, and you sort of get the whole view. Of course, there's also, you can do, according to the event or the, or the subject, you can do close-ups, you can shoot from behind, you could shoot um, some horizontal, some vertical, give them choices, you know, maybe you'll get a magazine cover, and magazine covers, last I looked, they're all verticals. Um, the, the one 
magazine cover I'm really happy about. You know, they took a horizontal and they sliced it down. I'm fine with that. I made the cover. Um, from high or from low, from shooting from low is a very common place for talk. We'll see, we'll see examples later and talk about it where photographers shoot from. Uh, behind the scenes shots will show not just the event going on, but sort of like the behind the scenes, either the logistics or the setup for it. And turnaround is, is where you literally, you may be looking at what everyone's generally looking at, but it could be that behind you something is going on. We'll see one minor example of it later. And that's also an interesting shot. You see, you're photographing a protest. There's a thousand people, pro, and you'll see an example, pro-immigrant protest, pro-DACA, you know, protest. And behind you were six people saying, deport illegal aliens. Now, they only be six and there are a thousand, but that's also part of the story. And it's possible that is the story. But, you know, according to what the editor's doing, you don't, unless they tell you ahead of time what they're interested in, you don't know what they're going to be interested in. Um, so here's some example of typical medium shots. I, I don't claim these are going to win Pulitzer. I, I'm sure they won't win Pulitzer Prizes, but these are shots that are used very commonly um, for obvious reasons. The, here's a, here's some, a typical cutaway shot. You see the, um, the speaker, you see the audience, and you see both in one shot. So it sort of gives you a sense of the space, um, sort of like an x-ray from the side on some level. Um, and this is one of the most common shots uh, that photographers will take. So this is sort of a combination of a cutaway and behind the scenes. I'm not exactly in the side of Nancy Pelosi. I'm a little behind her. But now you also see this is a press conference. There is no general audience. It's just press and her. So you see um, the studio. You see all the press covering her. And it sort of gives you a sense of, of the whole event as opposed to just seeing the medium shot of her on the podium, which is a perfectly good shot and many times is what's used, but this might give someone a better sense of, of the event. Uh, another example of testifying before Congress, and you see the photographers and, and, the te and the people testifying. I admittedly didn't have a wider lens or I would have also taken, uh, got trying to get more of the uh, people on the uh, dais, as they call it down there, um, you know, asking questions of the witnesses. Um, Wide shot, typical, you get not just uh, Sarah Sanders in this case speaking, but you also get a sense of the, the reporters asking questions, you know, the cameras and the studio. Um, some rooms are very wide. This is like a 14 millimeter wide because you don't always get a choice. Most in photojournalism, unlike maybe some other genres, they don't pose for you generally. You have to work with what you have in front of you. Um, just to get a sense of the scene, there's the impeachment hearings. You, you see the, obviously the die, you see the photographers covering, you see the witnesses, you see the journalists covering them. It gives an overall view of what's going on, more than just getting one witness, which is also the appropriate shot and what you should probably get first. Um, going high, um, and you notice there are photographers going low in the center, and right just below Mitch McConnell, because that's a very common shot, as we'll see later. Um, this gives a sense of not just the Mitch McConnell speaking, which is an easy, straightforward shot, but also gives a sense of the entire event. And someone looking at it, they'll, they'll sort of get a better sense of, the, of what, what was going on there than if you just got a picture of Mitch McConnell standing at a podium. Uh, very high, you can do sort of abstract. Um, and below is, is probably the second most common shot, uh, one of a fake newsstand and uh, not a fake event. Um, but this is this is the classic, typical shot you would get that you would see photographers get from below. So let's talk some terminology jargon. Um, we'll go back. I'm going back to the same picture you saw before. So what we call the space between the front row of an audience or whatever that logical, if there's tables and the speaker and or stage is the buffer. As you can see here, there's about five, about six photographers in the buffer sitting down, basically to get the shot from below, like the Mike Pence shot, like this shot, basically. Um, and that's very common. And a lot of times photojournalists will ask the people running the event, can we go into the buffer if it's not obvious? This is a TV studio in, in the Capitol. It, it, this is norm, normal behavior, so to say. Um, so another thing, if you, if you uh, photograph certain events and you're credentialed for them, they will usually, any well-organized well event with a, that's of a good size, you'll, they'll, they'll tell you what the throw is, which is the distance from the media platform where maybe the only place you're allowed to stand, and the stage. And this is useful for you to plan what equipment to bring. Now, I should tell you, according to the kind of event or you know, the situation, you may only be able to be on the media platform because security is not allowed you to go anywhere else. And the media platform can be so crowded, you really, once you're packed in and starting to shoot, 
you really, it's not the subway at rush hour, but it's not far from it. And you really can't move, and that's the only shot you're going to get. It's just a matter of how long or how narrow, long or wide the picture is going to be. Um, this was the case where I can go up and down the media platform, but I couldn't really get past those umbrellas you see in the front, basically. Um, so when I get information about um, the distance to throw, I'll sometimes go to an online uh, photo calculator, and there's plenty of apps that do similar, and I'm sure other websites, and I'll put in... Um, the distance, that's the lower left, it says distance to shove, 150 feet. The focal length multiplier is one because I use a full frame camera. 500 millimeters is my uh, lens. And that tells me I'm going to get, if you look on the right, col right side column, uh, almost 11 feet by about a little over seven foot um, frame. That's what's going to be in the picture. And I can decide whether that's enough, too much, and what to do, what I want to do about that. Um, and this I find very useful to then debate what to bring because you can't bring everything you own, unless you don't own very much, you know, whatever. Especially if you use big lenses, you know, seven pound, you know, 15 inch lenses, you, you, you're not taking more than one of those with you at a time. Um, another uh, a tool I find useful, since we're talking planning here, is Photographer's Ephemeris. There are, other, there are apps that do this, other apps that do this, as well as this is a website, but they also have an app for your phone. And this will tell you um, for any place, any date and time, where the sun, what angle the sun will be, those are those various lines, and what angle the moon will be, and also how high it will be in the sky. Um, and if you look at the very bottom, that blue horizontal line, that's a slider. You can sort of slide through the day and see the lines move as the sun moves. And as you can see, I centered it on B&H photo, so I can sort of try to, if I wanted to plan when the sun's straight, coming straight down the street, I could theoretically do this and be there at time. Or if I want to avoid the sun, I could do the same thing. Um, so another term we use is preset. This is the time well before an event where you'll, be, you'll stake out your position on a media platform. This is the media platform for the July 4th event with uh, the president at the National Mall, if you recall. And it's a fairly large platform with about four level, four or five levels. Um, and we had to be there 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. And they call it a preset because then we have to leave and they spend a bunch of hours where security, secret service, et cetera, sweeps the area for any problematic item. And then we're let back in, in this case, it was probably five, six hours later um, to, to actually take up the position we staked out. And there's also the time they want you to usually bring in large equipment. So that's what, that's what the term preset means. Unless you shoot video, you'll never actually use this, but the people who refer to this on a platform, it's called a mult box. And for people shooting video or needing an audio feed, this is the, the mult box is where you'll get a, a sound, a signal from the sound system of the event. That, that people will plug into the camera. It's not like, well, you may not use it if you're shooting still photos. You'll be asked, do you see the mult box? People ask you to pass the wire. You know, they'll refer to it, so it's good to know what the uh, term means. Another term that's commonly used is stand-up. And this is not a very creative term. It's a someone literally standing up. They're either being interviewed or reported, or reporting live, or, or possibly recorded. Um, and this is a typical example. This is in the White House press briefing room, and uh, Kellyanne Conway was doing an interview. Uh, I don't know which network this was. And she's standing there being interviewed remotely. Um, in a live event on, on a media platform, you'll find this is actually fairly roomy. A lot of times it's really cramped. And you'll see you know, video cameras, one or two lights, sometimes on the side, sometimes above, and people um, uh, uh, on air talent. Uh, basically uh, do, giving reports. Um, you can see the, la the ladies in blue and yellow. There's a woman on the right with, in black. There's a woman in pink behind the blue lady. And there's a guy in a suit to the left of uh, the, the woman in yellow. And although this looks roomy, it actually is not so roomy. I was using a very wide angle lens. And this, the, the media platform is only medium crowded at that point. Um, but that's what it's standard. They'll ask, you'll need to know about it because they'll, they'll um, the video people will let you know they're doing it so you don't get in their way, you don't actually cross paths, et cetera, et cetera. They'll also, uh, as an aside, I didn't write this here, uh, video people are very um, sensitive to vibration. You know, still photographers, if the guy next to you moves on the platform and there's a little vibration, well, you're shooting a picture at, you know, a fairly fast shutter speed and you're shooting lots of them, so the chances are you don't have a, you're not going to have a problem. But video, they're going to see... The, the image, which is usually a live image, you know, shake. So they're very sensitive and they could be very, um, uh, what's the right word, adamant that you don't move or even that a lot of times they'll separate the video and the still photographers onto separate platforms so one doesn't disturb the other. 
Certainly if you get on or off a platform with live video, do it very carefully so it's not cause vibration. These are generally platforms that are not super sturdy. It's not buildings, these are temporary platforms. So let's talk about what's probably the most common thing that, um, I'm just gonna get rid of this little reminder in the corner. This, uh, the most common thing that a person shooting politics will probably shoot, a person who's talking. So I look for um, three things. I look for eyes, mouth, and gesture. Eyes meaning they don't blink. Now admittedly, you are not likely to have reflexes fast enough to time your shutter to avoid a blink, but when you're editing, you're gonna avoid, you're gonna, chances are you're gonna delete those photos. Ditto also, people when they talk, they move their mouth in all different directions, and I'm sure if you took 100 pictures of me talking right now, you would find a bunch of them, my mouth would be in a really odd looking position. So those, you can't know ahead of time, you don't have the fast enough reflexes to see the mouth moving in real time, but, but you also want to see, see the mouth and not be closed. But the other last thing is gesture. Um, you can take a picture, it looks like a mug shot, people just standing up like this, it's really not too great, but if I make a gesture, that's a bit more dynamic. And in fact, if you ever watch a live press conference, C-SPAN or whatever, and it's being covered by photographers, which plenty of them are that you'll see, you'll hear in the background shutter noise. And it's as if we're playing in the same, uh, we're playing an instrument, in this case the camera, off the same musical score. Uh, and you'll see, as soon as a person makes a gesture, you'll hear hundreds of, or tens or hundreds of clicks, and as soon as they put it down, it stops. So it's almost like the, you know, it's like the musical notes play, you know, a score, and that's what we're playing. So here are some examples. Obviously, you've seen this one before. Um, I see the eyes, the mouth isn't in a crazy position, and, he's, and the president's gesturing. Ditto. Now this is, you know, this might be a perfectly good, otherwise basic shot, but it's not too interesting compared to this or compared to that. Um, where he's obviously having a back and forth with that little that reporter in front. Um, and here are some other examples. If Nancy Pelosi had her hand down and she was just standing there, it might be dramatic. Her lighting's on her, it's dark otherwise. I was actually disappointed that I wasn't where the other photographers were, but she was leaving the room and she normally doesn't stop and turn around and talk, but someone asked her a provocative question. She turned and pointed and held her hand up, uh, finger up like that, and it became a dramatic moment. But uh, I was sort of disappointed at first. But if her arm was down, it wouldn't be a very interesting shot, although her light and the other's dark might be, who knows. Um, John Stewart motioning better than if his hands were down. Um, the, our former mayor certainly knew how to gesture there at a Trump rally a few years ago. Um, it might have been a nice shot the night before Election Day in 2016 when these two were standing there arm in arm. But waving goodbye it was almost foreshadowing what happened the next day. So I, I, I personally you know, think find meaning in that. Um, if this gentleman wasn't arguing with all these people around him uh, with, and, he was, and he had his arm down, it might be a nice, him standing there, the one non-Hasidic dressed person in the middle, but by motioning, it's sort of like he's having a conversation, it gives some animation to it. Ch Tony Blair was great, I had too many shots. He'd, I, I think some of these people, either they have naturally great at gesturing or they get trained in it or they look at themselves and they improve. Uh, but, you know, he's one of the people, there's others who, I had too many good shots because he, he just always came up with shots that were not just the mug shots standing there like this talking. Um, Al Sharpton here is, is motioning, but if you, cover, if you look just at the right side, actually Pete Buttigieg is also motioning. So I got two for one, although the, obviously the Sharpton gesture was more dramatic. And if you do selfies of yourself, it's obviously, you're gonna, you're gonna do a little bit, it's gonna be a little more interesting if you do the fake gesture, and it, trust me, that was a fake gesture, um, than if you're just standing there in the mugshot way. So now, now you've taken the pictures. Now we're gonna do a deep dive for most for a while into what you do with them afterwards. So um, there, th I'm sure there's many ways of going about what I'm doing and I'm, sh I'm guessing most people in this room take pictures and have a sense of what to do with them afterwards software-wise to create the final product that they're looking for. If you're, and there's other products than what I'm gonna talk about, but I'm talking about what are the most dominant ones and or what I use according to the situation. Virtually all, I'm not saying all, but virtually all photo uh, journalists that I have come across use photo mechanic. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a unique piece of software that's aimed mostly at photojournalists, although actually I used it before I was a photojournalist. It's, it's, the fa it's basically the fastest photo browser and has the, it's the most capable at, at doing, um, putting captions, headlines, and other information into the metadata. We'll talk about that later. And, so it's, and it's uniquely um, designed for photojournalists. But I act, like I said, I used it before I was a photojournalist because I just found it a good tool. The other most common uh, software that people use is Adobe Bridge, Lightroom, and Photoshop. 
uh, not necessarily all three. And most people have to then file the photos electronically. Um, FTP is how it's done. We'll talk a little bit later. And there's a free software that seems to be the dominant one called FileZilla that you could just Google and find. If you work for a large agency, you might get their custom home-built software, but most of the people use generic FTP software, and this seems to be one of the most common ones, and it happens to be free. Um, so let's just go over the general workflow of what people do. This may be too detailed as far as like everybody does it exactly like this, but then we're going to go even a level below, uh, deeper. First, you have to transfer the, your files from the your camera to the computer. Then you're going to cull what we do, we cull, or you cull, you cull your photos, get rid of the eyes closed, blink, you know, eye blinks, weird mouth formations, and believe me, if you haven't photographed talking heads much, you'll see that most humans make a lot of weird mouth formations in the course of speaking. A couple don't, but most do. Technical mistakes. You don't want anyone to see that you, you, the focus missed on that one or something like that. So you definitely delete that before anyone sees it. Um, so then you generally caption, although you can do it a little later, we'll see in a minute. Um, if you're shooting news, there's generally requirements about headline, cap, uh, headline, caption, city, state. There's various fields you have to fill in in the metadata. We'll talk more about it later. Um, it's referred to as IPTC, which is, as, as you see, International Press Telecommunications Council. Um, the other part of metadata that you probably are all familiar with is EXIF. I'm blanking what it stands for, but basically that's where the camera records the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, and plenty of other, uh, and the time and date. Um, and that you're not going to touch. In fact, you shouldn't touch it because that then becomes misrepresentation as to when the photo was taken. You, after, after you've done that, you'll crop the photos. Most agencies, I'm not sure all because I know one ex exception, want at least 3,000 pixels on the long side. So going back to when we were planning that shot with a 150-foot throw, and it's going to be 11-foot by 7-foot uh, frame, basically using a 500-millimeter lens. Well, but if I want a close-up just this big, which is maybe... 30 inches or more, three feet by four, maybe I'm using only a quarter of that frame if I'm a tw using a 24 megapixel uh, camera. So, it, so you have to keep in mind that you want your end product to have at least 3,000 pixels. Now, occasionally you get this amazing shot. You don't have 3,000 pixels, but it's so amazing, you'll submit it or tell them you should take this one anyway because this is you really got the shot that you know is unique and great. But in general, th this is what you have to plan for. You then do color and tonal corrections, uh, white balance being you know, part of that. You then have to generate a set of JPEGs for the client or clients you're working with. And then different clients have different requirements for the metadata. Some want their name in your metadata. Some want you to, it's all various things. We'll talk about it later. And then you upload, which is the FTP generally. Um, so now we're gonna go a little, a little deeper. Um, generally, people use card readers. They don't connect the camera straight to the computer. There's nothing wrong with that. Usually, the card readers are faster than what some direct would be connections. Um, they're some of the uh, most experienced uh, uh, photojournalists I see, they have card readers Velcroed to the top of the laptop with short cables, sometimes going into a little mini hub on the laptop top. And that goes into it because you don't have enough USB connections so that they can plug their card straight into the front of the laptop where the card readers are, and it goes straight in. Um, generally, people use multiple cameras. Um, and since, unless you change it with your camera, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a second, as you see, all your cameras put out files either underscore DSC underscore a number or DSC underscore a number. That's a standard um, that all, camera, all digital cameras use. Um, I highly recommend you rename your photos because otherwise photos from one shoot will have the same name as another. And it's going to be hard to tell where it came from and if you accidentally overwrite one with the other, etc. So in this case, we'll talk more about naming later. Um, it's White House. Now, uh, 2002, well, 2002-11, which is my, the way I'll explain later, is 2020, February 11th. M1L is Marine One Landing. It's something to differentiate it. And then that's a four-digit num sequence number. Um, now, most times you're going to use multiple cameras, and you have to merge the, the, file, the files from both cameras into one. So there's a few things you need to do. First, you should make sure your cameras have the correct time. And the United States government gives you a free website called time.gov, and that is the standard time for the United States. And you, would, you want your cameras to be within two seconds of each other. And it's generally pretty easy to do that. Um, because when you merge the photos in using capture time, you'll sort by capture time, you don't want six photos of this guy and then a photo of someone else, a couple of someone else, and then go back to more photos 
of the same person you were shooting, it sort of makes it hard to edit. You're going back and forth and a couple photos are here, a couple photos are there. Now, all the, I think pretty much every DSLR, uh, and maybe even you know, uh, other cameras are not, let you change that three letter uh, file name. So everyone by default is DSC, you know, underscore DSC or DSC, whether it's JPEG or, or RAW. Or raw. Um, I changed mine because otherwise the DSCs will overlap. So I'll have DSC underscore one, two, three, four from each of two cameras. So if you have two D5s, you'd have D, I, I, the way I do it, I, I change those three letters to be D5A and D5B. And of course, if you have more than that, it'd be D5C, D, E, and F. Chances are you're not going to run out of letters if, uh, for a particular, you're not going to have more than 20 something cameras of the same model. I mean, I'm sure there's some exception, but you know, most of us probably aren't in that category. Um, so now captioning. Virtually, every, I, I'm, I could guarantee you, everyone I've ever dealt with wants you to put in a caption, you know, describing what's in the scene, a headline, um, the city, state, and country, and some places also want location. Location would be more specific than city. The White House, the U.S. Capitol, B&H photo is a specific location. But I put a question mark because not everybody requires it. There's no downside. I don't think anybody's ever said to me, don't put it in, but I'm just saying, this is when I use the word minimum in the title, it's because I think everyone wants these other things. Um, so in the caption, it's very basic. You're not, you're not the reporter, although if you write a really good longer uh, caption, nobody, most people won't complain, although some agencies only want a couple sentences. They don't want a long one. But it's who, what, when, and where. And when the when, you're not going to put down the when, well, you may put down the when, but you, you need to make sure your camera date and date because the places you file with may look at this and if there's a major discrepancy, you know, ask you about that, and you don't want to have those questions for a simple thing, uh, for a simple thing that you can correct ahead of time. I will let you know, m my personal experience with DSLRs is the time doesn't drift much, meaning, you know, a month from now that the time will be sort of fairly accurate. I found with the mirrorless cameras I'm using lately, I, I adjusted every couple of weeks at most because they seem to drift more. So I would suggest checking on a regular basis your time, because you need it within two seconds, it's not like, oh, I'll be late for an appointment and a minute doesn't matter, but here, a couple seconds matter because it's the time it takes to put one camera down and pick up the other, um, that makes a difference. So a couple seconds is important, that is important. Typical caption, um, the way I do it now, because um, one agency said they want it in this format, uh, but there's, there's, there's not always required. You know, I do the date, the, 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 the city, state, and the, the country they want, and then a basic, a basic uh, President Donald Trump speaking with the press in the East Room of the White House. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, major pros. Um, so culling, there's a few ways of culling. And I've seen people do two different, there are two different ways. One is probably faster. One probably is a little better on, the, on getting the absolute best photos to the end. Because remember, news is, becomes history if you wait too long to, from the time you take the picture to the time you file. And in, in plenty of cases, they'll say to you, we want this within 30 minutes of the end of an event. Or they may say to you, I have seen photographers sit on the floor at an event, they take pictures for, you know, some people speak for a long time. You take the first 20 minutes, the next 20 probably looks about the same most of the time. And I've seen photographers sit on the floor with a laptop in their, you know, on the knee, on the knees, and they're editing and filing before the speaker has ever, you know, finished what he or she is saying. So um, what I do is I use, you call it a pyramid or filter, going from the maximum to the minimum. So I, I usually go through um, one round of, just go through, get rid of all the bad photos. Stuff I'm sure I'm not going to use. Uh, there's no reason I'll ever show it to anybody. I'll never file it. And then I usually go through one more because um, I find that I missed stuff the first time. Um, and so captioning, which is sometimes done before this, can also be done after this point. And the reason why you might want to do it after this is, so let's say you have 10 logical shots in your, what you shot. There are 10 logical scenes you've shot or subjects. It may turn out that after culling, you've eliminated one or two of those because the pictures were bad or the, either the person, a technical mistake or whatever it is. Now you have eight. So since time is of a factor, because this is news, um, you, if you caption after you cull, not only do you deal with less photos, although you're only going to caption one in a series and then apply the same caption to all the others, um, like copy and paste to a whole group. Um, if afterwards they only have eight scenes and I started with 10, well, it's less to caption. It's also fewer photos I'm dealing with. So you can do it before or after. There's no absolute right or wrong. Um, I find a useful feature of Lightroom. So um, I will, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I will generally star the photos I think are select. So I do the two rounds of culling. I then star the ones I think might possibly make the final selection I'll file. But usually I'll end up with more than I'm going to actually use. Because you're going through them sequentially. You have 100, 200 shots. You can't remember if the one you saw at number 151 is better than number 27. So you sort of pick all the ones above a certain 
level that all are worthwhile. Um, so in Lightroom, you, when you port those into Lightroom, you, you can then highlight just that group of that one scene, and you could set it so that um, it only shows you, you know, the, the rating of, let's say, a certain number of stars, and as you go through them, when you highlight, you only see those. You don't see all the other photos. You could then lower the numbers, hitting the number key, and then you'll end up, as you'll see the count, as the number of photos you want of that person. So I do the final selection in Lightroom, but that doesn't mean you have to. Now, the other way, which is probably faster, and I think actually the, the fastest, is people using, whether it's Bridge or Photo Mechanic, will go through um, the photos, and as soon as they see one, they'll either look at a contact sheet or they'll quickly go through it. They'll pick out a few. They'll immediately uh, move that into Photoshop or, or Lightroom, and they will uh, um, process those and create a JPEG. And then they'll go back, get another one, work on one at a time and go back and forth. And that's probably the fastest way because you're just going, okay, that's a good one, I process it, and then they may be filing it immediately, they may be on strict deadline. Um, the way I typically do it is probably a little slower. I think it ends up with, you know, I'm sure I got the right ones, but the first, second one is faster and that may be the primary uh, concern you have at that moment. Then you're gonna generally correct the photos. Wait, did I leave one out? Oh, wait. Oh, somewhere, I don't know if I put crop in here, but you're gonna crop. I crop them next before I color and, you know, totally correct it. And these are the kind of things, according to what program you use, maybe call it, you know, different programs use different words. So there's the basic. The bottom, you, for ethical reasons, it's a no-no. You really don't do this. This is like, there's no acceptable circumstance when you would. No deletions, clones, or additions when you're editing. Um, some clients uh, require a certain color space, sRGB or Adobe. As I said before, um, 3,000 pixels. Don't enlarge the photos. That's also a no-no. I don't know any place that uh, accepts that. Um, some, every place I, I deal with, except one, has a ma or actually except two, have a maximum file size. So a lot of times if I'm doing multiple clients, I have one that wants a maximum file size of 2 meg, one 2.6, one 5, and then others are unlimited. So I have to create different sets. So that's important. Um, and resolution, I know of one place that doesn't want more than 4,000 pixels on a side. You know, I don't make this up. That's just what they do, and you just have to follow instructions. Um, now, some clients have very specific requirements what goes into the IPTC metadata. Some want certain keywords there with their name or their credit, um, a job, a creative job title. And a lot of times, these are fixed and don't change. Sometimes the keyword changes, um, and you could use templates. So Photo Mechanic has templates. I'm not sure about Bridge. So I have a template for each client, and I could just then apply that template to all the photos that are going to that client, and it's one step. It's not like one by one or anything, and I don't have to repeat or retype this. Um, then the last part is you FTP. Um, uh, File Transfer Protocol stands for. This is what the pho PhotoZilla screen looks like. It's not in, actually in the process of transmitting. It's a fairly easy program. So I keep track of what I've done um, for all sorts of good reasons. Um, I use a Google spreadsheet, and this is not exactly what I use, but for every uh, group of photos that I submit to a client, uh, there's the data uploaded, what it is, like the headline, the, and the number of images. Now, the last column is comments or clients. If you have a lot of different clients, and you don't do a lot with each one, you might just use this column for um, which client it's to, so you can sort of track what you've done. Um, I actually uh, use a different, as I said in the bottom, use a different sheet, one sheet per client. I just find it easier to track that way. All the, all the uploads for a particular client are on the same uh, spreadsheet. So how do I organize my files? There's multiple ways of doing this. This is what I find easy, efficient, et cetera, but obviously you can do different. I have it first by year. You know, I have different folders, one for each year. And then I have uh, for each shoot or each day, it's according to what it is sometimes, uh, you could be in a place and you shoot multiple things in the same location on the same day, I may, and I may just have one uh, folder for that. Um, you may have information files that the, the sponsor or you have found that tell you about what it is you're shooting, and you may put the files in that top level. Then the other th three top level folders that go right there also is raw LR cat because I use Lightroom, and export. So let me explain a little bit. So the raw is obviously we put your raw fo files, whether it's JPEG or, or raw, these are, these are the old files, this is the stuff you've shot. Now Lightroom, when you do an import, you can specify which files to import. So remember, I'm on, I have time as a consideration. Ingesting large, lots of raw files takes time. So I don't want to ingest my, my, my selects when I'm actually 
on 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 the clock, so to say. And later on, so I put all the fo- all my files initially into the Q um, folder, which is the one below raw. Once I've uh, figured out what are my selects that I want to actually work on and possibly submit, I then is an easy way in Photo Mechanic and prop, I think Bridge also, but I know Bridge as well. Um, you move those, only those files into the raw folder, and then when you start up Lightroom, you tell it to import all files from just the raw folder. If you had every file there, you'd have to manually unselect the ones you don't want to import, and that would slow you down. I have a, I have a, I have a folder for the Lightroom catalog, and then I have an export folder, and for each client I'm exporting, I have their, their um, files. And the reason why it's not the same is, well, first, the different um, size requirements, different IPTC metadata requirements, so they can't be the same set of uh, files. Um, and then since I do social media, I'm guessing most people here do, I have a, I have a folder I put my social media um, files into. Usually those are smaller, and I put a watermark on those to the extent that that stops you know, ripping off, but um, that's what I do. Um, now, you, I highly suggest you be consistent in your naming. Otherwise, finding you have 100 folders from what you shot this year or more, and now you've got to find that photo. And um, you may know what day you did it, but unless you name it with the date first. So what, here's a ex- typical example of what I do is um, I was uh, following Joe Biden in, in Iowa last summer uh, and photographed him a few times. So I would have Joe Biden, the date, and notice I'm doing year month, day, because computers sort like it's a number as opposed to files, uh, folders, uh, files and folders, but as if it's a number, not a date. So it sorts in order. If I wrote November 2nd, um, you know, 2019, and then November 3rd, 2020, they would put one right after the other, even though one's a year later. So this, to, to, to the computer will sort uh, well this way. And I'll usually, not always, put some words after it, tell me exactly what's in there, if, 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 if there's a logical thing I can if it makes sense to whatever it is. Um, and if you're consistent, that would also make your life easier. Um, back up your files. So in the field, um, meaning not at home with a big desktop computer, um, some people use portable hard drives. Um, that's perfectly legitimate, especially solid state, which are more rug- rugged and uh, smaller and faster. I actually like to use U- large USB thumb drive, flash drives. I have like 256 and 512 gig ones, which is more than enough. And I like the idea that they're very small, they're, fa- they're fast, USB 3.1 or, or 3. Um, and they're not likely to break. Also, just by being small, it's easy to pack. A lot of times, you barely fit into whatever backpack or rolling case. Um, and at home, I use external hard drives. But there's plenty of people who use portable external hard drives. And as I skipped over, um, a lot of cameras have two memory card slots. And um, the second one, you could set just to be a backup. So now, if you screw up or make a mistake or something happens to the first card, you can always go back to the second card in the camera. So this is basically what I let me switch. Yeah, this is basically what I do. I I, I manually. Some people use like um, Photo Mechanic has ability and some of the programs where it'll sense you plugging in a new memory card into your reader, and it will automatically do certain things. I admittedly don't do that. I find it. I'm more reassured. I f- I'm very uh, um, uh, capable on a computer, so I just manually copy all the files from my card readers into the computer, usually into the Q folder we spoke about, and that's where naming the files at DSC, renaming it to D5A, D5B, whatever you have one for each camera, um, uh, means that they won't collide and overwrite each other. I then cull the photos in Photo Mechanic. I do the basic captioning. I uh, select what I want. By, and I usually put a star on them. Then in Lightroom, I'll do the final selections. I'll crop, tonal color correct. I'll generate JPEGs. I'll go back into Photo Mechanic now because I've exported the JPEGs into one of those client folders. And for each client who wants different IPTC metadata specific to the client, you know their name, whatever it is, I then do that in Photo Mechanic because that's also the tools in Photo Mechanic for dealing with IT, IPTC metadata are probably the best around, and that's why everybody uses it, and it's also faster and easier. I then I like Adobe Bridge for quality control, not for that I can see the photo, but because when you go through in a contact sheet and you go through the various pictures, you can have one of your windows um, be the uh, the metadata, and you can then watch. You can see the metadata for each um, uh, picture, and because you're in a rush. So it's not unlikely you made a mistake. 
So I go through and I just make sure that I didn't screw up any metadata. I, I, I didn't accidentally say Fred was Joe because I highlighted a whole bunch and put the caption for Joe where it should have been Fred or whatever. So I go through and I just check it quickly. Sometimes I just spot check it, but it's worth checking, at least to me. Then I just use FTP and I back up my, my files. The, the other step which I didn't put here is a lot of time, virtually every uh, client wants you to send them an email, an old fashioned email that'll just have the headline, the number of images, and maybe something else they ask in the body, just, and you send it to the photo desk or the picture desk or whatever they're calling it to, to, to alert them you just filed something. Because maybe you made a mistake, it didn't get there, so an editor will eventually see it. Now a lot of humans don't do a lot in this, it's a lot of automated, but they'll usually do some basic check. So there's still, some people shoot raw, some through JPEG, they each have some merit. I personally only shoot raw these days and have for a long time. But there are definitely photojournalists who have been, who've been around a long time and are doing very well, you know, respected. They shoot JPEG. So why shoot one versus the other? Um, and this is, this is basic, nothing to do specifically with, for the most part, with photojournalism. You get a larger dynamic range with raw photos. You could pull more detail out of shadows or pull more detail out of highlights. It looked blown out. Um, you could change the, and for me, the white balance after. It's one of the problems of photojournalism. You don't get to control the light. So typical place, there's a recessed light. It's incandescent or a warm, uh, warm uh, white bulb, not a cool white. And there's a window light that's bluish compared to the 3200 or whatever it is coming up. So the top of the head looks yellow, you know, relatively, and the, the, the face looks a little bluish. Now you can't, your, our eyes, of course, I hold a white piece of paper up in any circumstance, your eyes and brain say it's white, but the camera still only can do one white balance for the whole uh, scene uh, at a time. So you'll never get, you're not gonna go into Photoshop and twiddle every bit to get it exactly perfect, but by being able to do the white balance off, if your camera guessed wrong or guessed differently than what you wanted, you can change it afterwards. So that's like a huge, to me, benefit of, of RAW. File size, obviously RAW is much bigger and JPEGs are smaller, so it's, it's, there's an advantage, small is easier to deal with, and, um, and plenty of people do that. Um, it also means if you screw up, you have more, uh, the other advantage of RAW is if you screw up anything or uh, you can fix it more easily in RAW because there's more um, flexibility in the post-processing. You could abuse the file more, so to say. So personally, I find, we'll talk about it a little later, I find if when you're in low light circumstances, remember you don't control the light, it is what it is, um, the higher the ISO, the more noise in your photos. Obviously, most people would say noise is not good. Sometimes for artistic reasons, you want noise, but most of us don't want noise in the kind of photos we're talking about here. So I find it better sometimes to underexpose by a stop in, in raw, shooting raw, and then when processing, brighten using the exposure slider or whatever the, your uh, program is, use the exposure slider to bring it back up as opposed to shooting at that much higher in ISO, which is, oh, is gonna be noisy from the get-go, meaning I find more latitude there, better to have a lower noise photo and to make it lighter as opposed to a high, higher ISO and not have to change it, but the, then there will be no, more noise there. And just um, backing up, I didn't mention Capture One or other software programs that uh, people, I know people use and love and have much merit, but truth be told, I've never seen anyone, photojournalist that is, use anything but the software, those packages that I'm talking about. That doesn't mean the others don't have merit, it just, for whatever reason, that's the norm, and that's the way it is. Now, JPEGs may have a faster workflow speed because you're dealing with smaller files, and there's less things you could change about it, maybe. So some, some people think it's faster in JPEG, I don't think it's much difference, actually, other than the file size. So, uh, switching subjects again, people wonder, how do they get access to shoot some of these things? Um, so I'm going to talk about access in New York City specifically. If you want to know about Washington, D.C. or somewhere else, we could talk um, after my presentation one-on-one. -on -one. So in New York City, most things are, are controlled by the New York City Police Department. And at some events, like the Easter Bonnet Parade, you can walk around wherever you want, take whatever picture you want. There are police around, but there's no police barricades. On the other hand, for parades, um, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, the uh, Gay Pride Parade, the Pride Parade in June, you know, you can't go into the street and take pictures. You have to stand where spectators stand. Um, so in New York City, that's controlled by the police. Same for protests. Now, some protests, you can walk almost anywhere. You don't need any pass. But there also might be a pen for media that you could only get into. You get a better spot or more room or whatever. Um, the way it works in New York City is it's um, New York City Police Department is the entity that issues um, cards that look like this. Um, and that's what the police 
then will look at to let to know that you're media and should let you go past whatever the police barricade is. Basically, what they need to know is you'll you go on their New York City Police Department website, the information there is that you have a legitimate reason to cross a police line. And what they ask for, and there's a catch-22, we'll talk about how to get around, is they want to know that you have a legitimate reason to be across the police line, and there's no reason why you, you have to be, should be there for your job in the media. And, you, and what they'll ask for is six examples from six different events, not six different, that you've had publications from. So you, you've shot six different events that involve the police line. You've, you were published, each of those events, you could show a publication. They'll ask you for the URL, and you could show examples of that. Okay, here's the catch-22. How do you get those photos without getting past the police line in the first place? Well, uh, there's plenty of things you could shoot that you may not get to where the press can go, but you can get plenty of really good shots. The getting published part is a whole nother business here. And therefore, that's how you initially probably get there. The other way is if you get employed by a recognized news agency, they all, they, they, there's a method where they can basically vouch for you, you know, in, in writing in some way, but that's it. The UN has a similar uh, setup if you want to shoot pictures of the UN, except there, you don't have to show you've, you've done it before because the UN is much more of a controlled environment. You can't have the pictures from before because there is no access. And there, they give you, on the initial go-round, you need an assignment letter from your editor in a recognized news outlet, and they'll give you four months to shoot there and get published. And then the next time, which you get in a 12-month renewal, you have to show that you've been published. So you're not just giving it to somebody who never gets published as a legitimate person. Now, you may see other types of press IDs. Um, and when I was starting out, I didn't have the New York City or the uh, UN. The UN, uh, one second, looks something like this. Um, there were organizations, the National Press Photographers Association, the New York Press Photographers Association, the American Society of Media Photographers, that will issue a press ID. Now, there's no, absolutely no guarantee that any entity will honor that and let you pass the line. Um, I find that actually those might be more useful outside New York City than inside New York City. But they, there are times when those will be, will be what you will need and they will be honored. The law enforcement or whoever controls the jurisdiction or the event will say, yes, you must be a legitimate media and they'll let you into the media area with your camera. Um, if you're shooting a conference, which a lot of times that's where news happens, um, or other private events, you need from the, the organizer of the event, you'll have to contact and get permission. And then you ask for what's called media access. That's the term used. You say, I'm requesting media access, I, blah, 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 you know, therefore I should get that. I mean, basically, you know, I'm a, uh, I work for this place, whatever, whatever it may be, uh, et cetera. They may, ask, they may have a form you fill out, they may have to get an assignment letter from an editor, but that's basically, because it's their private property, their private event, you can't just walk in, legally at least. Um, so in New York, so I'm standing in the street here. Okay, that's a good shot. But the people on the side probably wasn't a much different shot. I mean, it's standing in the street here again. Uh, very colorful parade every June. A little hot and humid sometimes, too. I warn, I warn you, we're sunscreen. Um, but I've shot Manhattan heads. You know, twice a year, the sun comes straight down the street, the, the, the streets, and this got published. I didn't need special access. I was on 2nd Avenue and uh, 42nd Street with a long lens. And when the light was green, we all run out into the center of the street to hold the cameras up. I suggest you underexpose by four or five stops because otherwise you blow out the sun, and then you try to add, this is where raw helps you because you have more latitude. You then add back exposure into the buildings, otherwise it's all black, although maybe that's what you want. Um, I did not have any special access this year. Other years I've shot the marathon, I had a, a press ID and I could be in the street. Um, the tributes in light from the, from the Brooklyn Bridge Park, I mean, anybody could stand there. Uh, a lot of protests, there's no barrier. I mean, there is, you certainly, there may be barriers, but a lot of, you, could do, you shoot a lot of things without necessarily needing a, a New York City press credential. Um, it is my turnaround example. There were hundreds of people shooting the pro-DACA or pro-immigrant rally. This was probably after um, the president was elected and he issued those you know, travel bans. But there was a few people, you'll find it's usually the same six people, four to six people, that you recognize them after a while. Um, and then, so, but, but the article may, that may have highlighted them. So you should at least turn around and get the other side. Um, shooting weather shots, whether in Central Park, I don't show any here, but I've shot in Central Park, you can get some great weather shots. You don't generally need, there's no police barricade, and these get used, um, sometimes more than you expect. I mean, it varies, of course. So, um, you want to be a photojournalist, and you want to sort of get into the community of photojournalists. The first organization um, 
is is a no-brainer in my opinion. You don't need any any special anything except you pay a membership fee. You get a magazine. Um, the National Press Photographers Association. Um, you get a magazine. It's I think it's bi-monthly. I'm bi every other month. I don't remember exactly monthly or every other month. Uh, that's that's interesting, worthwhile. The only other magazine that I thought was worthwhile was Photo District News. But for those who follow, that just went folded a couple months ago. So this is possibly when the only um, magazine that's regularly published that's uh, for photojournalists. Um, there's a local organization not affiliated with NPPA, similar letters, but not the New York Press Photographers Association. And those are generally people working in the field. So whereas NPPA is anybody could join, um, NYPPA, um, they want to know that you're actually are working photojournalist usually. Um, uh, worthwhile, but uh, uh, different. But NPPA is, I think, a no-brainer. Um, so let's talk how you market or, or promote yourself. Of course, some of you may be lucky. You don't need to market or self-promote. You get hired. You, you get a staff job. You get an internship leading to staff jobs. You never have to market. Well, for the rest of us, you need to sort of sh show, show the world what you can do. Um, of course, if you get, you know, you, maybe you could bypass this, but most of us can't. So there's three major for, for the purpose of this discussion about photojournalism, there are three major social media uh, sites, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. By far, and that's why I bolded it, almost all photojournalists, if they're online, are probably on Instagram. Photographers they seem to favor that a lot. So if you can only be on one, be on Instagram. Um, Twitter and Facebook, it varies. You know, you could, you could argue which one. I like Facebook only because it's so flexible in the format of the photo, whereas Instagram, you have to sort of like constrain, you have, it's more restricted, the number of photos, the aspect ratio, what you, you have to do it all on your phone versus it's easy on Facebook. You can do lots of photos, not just up to 10. So, but Instagram is the dominant social media platform for photographers from what I've observed. Um, some people use Twitter and I use all three, but I, um, I probably get more photos on Facebook because it's easy and it's easy to work with. But the Instagram is what most people are gonna see. Um, I also, on Instagram mostly, follow those whose work I admire um, for ideas to, you know, inspiration, education, whatever. Um, so the other way you sort of could approach yourself, there's, there's four things here. Portfolio reviews. Um, a number of entities run portfolio reviews. You want to be very careful. Some are free. ASMP, for instance, which I'm not mentioning here, has a free one but um, you have to join the organization. It's only for members. Um, you want to look at, especially for the ones where they're charging you real dollars, like at least $50 a review for 10 or 20 minutes with a reviewer. Um, you want to look at the reviewer's prof, uh, uh, bios to know that these are people that are worthwhile to talk to. They're worthwhile because they're going to give you feedback from somebody who's an who's a experienced working pro. You're going to get more than just amateur hour or just somebody's opinion. Um, or their editors or assignment editors, the people who might hire you if they or if you could pitch an idea to that 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 they're in a position to potentially hire you or refer you. I ended up working at one of uh, the uh, wire services I worked for that I'm a contributor at because I went to a portfolio review and they someone said I have a friend and that friend worked at this other place and I've been contributing ever since and I'm quite overall quite pleased with that connection. But I would have never done that if I hadn't gone to that portfolio review. Um, so they love to see stories, like you have a whole photo essay arc of, you know, you, you hope that. Um, personal projects are sort of like photo stories, same difference. And then um, you may just have singles, basically lots of very good individual shots, but that isn't necessarily a story involved. Those are the kind of things you show to them. Contests, there are photojournalism contests. I imagine winning one of those is, is going to get you some recognition. However, be careful. There's a few reputable ones. Certainly, NPPA runs reputable ones, um, and NYPPA and some others. But there's others that basically you're signing away your rights, not just for them to use your photo to say this is the first place or to advertise the contest, but then it's almost like a wire service or a photo agency. You basically told them they can use it for anything they want and never pay you. And you've paid them to enter the contest. So you've paid them to stock their photo agency. Uh, and you've signed it away. It was all there. You just didn't read the fine print. Um, uh, websites, um, I, I don't, it's easy enough these days. You can do one where it's mostly template-driven, where you don't have to start from scratch, like Photo Shelter, which is a very popular, common one. 
among photographers in general. There are others. I'm just using that because I'm most familiar, but I, I've heard of Zenfolio and there's others. Or you can roll your own website using whatever website creation tools you want. I would recommend, it's not here, your domain name should not be, you know, it should make some sense. Figure out what you want. You want a, you want a domain name. I use Splitstone Media for a variety of reasons, but including it's easy to spell. It's, you know, people could remember it. It's not ambiguous with other words. When you see it written, you won't mistake the letters for numbers. Like if it's, you know, according to the context, it's simple. But in the, it looks more professional. So think carefully about what you want. You can get multiple domain names, but chances are you want one because people aren't going to, you know, these, you know, it's just it's easier. Now, LinkedIn is not used a lot. However, LinkedIn is free. And some people use it. There's no downside whatsoever. You can put whatever you want up there. And I use it sometimes as my Rolodex because if I link to people, I can then, oh, I have money to get in touch with so-and-so. I don't have their contact or I'll, I'll look. So it's just a matter of, it's like, like putting your business card online. People could find you. Um, there's no downside. I don't think it's used a lot. It is used, but it's not used a lot. Instagram is probably the most used. Okay. Um, business cards. I try different ways of marketing myself. Because um, I also do event work and headshots and other stuff. And a lot of them really were wastes of my money, as I found out. Unfortunately, I didn't waste a whole lot of money, but I realized they, they weren't for me working. On the other hand, business cards are very practical. Plenty of times you meet somebody um, and, and you want to exchange information. Now, if, you, if you're old enough to remember Palm Pilots years ago, it used to be a way of beaming your contact info to each other. You just aim it at the other one's Palm Pilot. Well, they're not around anymore, and no other scheme seems to, although some, there have been some that have tried, no other, no, no, no other similar scheme has seems to have taken over. So business cards are practical. Um, so um, there's two companies that seem to dominate this business, and they're easy and online, Moo and Vistaprint. The, um, the, the unique uh, selling point, one unique selling point of Moo, and a lot of photographers use it, the quality is very good, is you can give them a, a whole set of images Let's say you give them 25 images, and let's say, so the back of the card has your name and contact, but the, the other side of the card can be 25 different images, and according to how many you buy, it repeats it every 5, 10, or 25, whatever the maximum number is. So you can almost have a portfolio when you hand the business cards, because you have like 10 or 20 images. Um, it gives you some flexibility. They're a bit more expensive. Um, Vistaprint is sort of the value-oriented. I, I did have Moo cards at one point. I used Vistaprint. But Vistaprint, is, it's very inexpensive, but then you're using their templates. They look very common, they're not you know, particularly high end. But with Vistaprint, you can get premium, pay. you can also pay extra. So what I do with Vistaprint is, you could upload a JPEG and they'll just reproduce your JPEG with everything you want on it onto a card. So you could do the fanciest or non-fanciest design and, and they'll reproduce that. So um, you definitely should have name, email, phone, website, social media, and maybe your images also, according to what you want. I've said no street address because your clients don't care where you live. In fact, it could constrain you. They say you live in New York, but you want to get hired by someplace different. Well, that person's New York. I don't want to pay to send them out. So I'll go on to someone else who I don't you know, whatever. So there's no advantage usually to put your address down, your street address, that is. And of course, if you move, then you got to redo your cards. Um, there are places like agency access. You can buy email lists of, of people in the, in the media business. I've never done it. Um, but there are people who, who do have email lists that send out to those people. Here's what I'm doing now. Here's some examples, like a little newsletter. And they're hoping to get assignments. And it does work for some people. I, I haven't really explored that. Um, so this is my business card. I, I put examples of the kind of stuff I shoot on the back. I, I actually, I thought about putting one or two really good images, but then you're sort of constrained by that. Um, so I decided to put more on. It's all personal preference. And then, of course, I try to gender balance it and also uh, politically balance it so they don't get uh, uh, categorized as a Democratic or Republican or, or, a, or a favor men over women or, or vice versa. Truth be told, sometimes I, I've been trying to figure out my next cards it's going to look like image-wise, and it's sometimes hard to find a, a even mix of gender and political uh, affiliation. So that's actually been a problem, which is why I'm still using this card, and John McCain is still on it. Who you know? Who I photographed only a week before he announced he had brain cancer, but um, I haven't come up with. I have good images, but I just I haven't found a good um, balance. Like the same number of women as men, as Democrat, Republican, whatever. So on the card, I have exactly what I said there. Um, I purposely. I know it's very in to have your your print microscopic. You know, it's really hip. But 
you know, people sometimes have trouble reading really small print. So I purposely have this as a very readable size, and um, et, et cetera. So learning more. Um, there's plenty of photojournalism-specifically oriented workshops that are respected. Here's a list of them. I will um, recommend the bottom one as a starter. I've been to it. Um, first off, it, it alternates every other year, either in Fairfax, Virginia, or Island, New Jersey. So it's not very far. It's not very expensive. And um, in fact, it's probably an excellent first workshop. Um, and, oh, it's, it's, and it's not expensive. And it's, it's not far to go. Um, and there is a portfolio review at night um, on two of the nights. And there's multiple tracks. And there's some vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Atlanta Photojournalism Workshop, I haven't been to, but I looked at the program. It looked similar to the NPPA Northern Short Course. So it's similar and different, except it's on a weekend, whatever. Each of these others have, are very well respected, um, and you have to decide what you want. If you want to go to France, then the International Festival of Photojournalism is extremely well respected. Um, uh, the Eddie Adams is northern New York in a rural area. Missouri is some town in New Jersey. Uh, I forget where the foundry is, um, and uh, the Kalish is, I think, also upstate New York. Uh, but it's very story editing oriented, so it's not a, it's not a general uh, workshop or et cetera. So books, I'm a, I, I read a lot. Um, this is, this, in my opinion, the single best book on photojournalism. If you buy one book on photojournalism, especially if you haven't an exact experience, this is the book to buy. It's A to Z. And there's no other book that has as much in it or covers the, the breadth with as much breadth and depth. So it's one book. Um, it's a big book. Um, it's medium priced um, and it's well respected. And I think it's on like the seventh or eighth edition. It's not, so it's been around a while. If you shoot sports, this was the best book I found on sports. Peter Reed Miller is a very experienced sports photographer, Sports Illustrated uh, photographer. Um, and I thought it had the most practical advice of someone actually doing it. Um, there's a number of books on war and conflict. Admittedly, I have no personal experience with that, but whatever. Um, I think all three of these books have merit. The first, the third is more of, a, of an experience of doing it, but the first two probably give you more in the trenches feel um, of it. Um, so let's talk equipment. We're in B&H. They do equipment. Um, and they've, they have taken a lot of my money over the years you know, in that, uh, for that purpose, which I'm not complaining about. Um, so the most basic kit that photojournalists have, not the only kit, would be, and would be two full-frame bodies, generally Nikon, Canon, or Sony, not in that particular order. You know, um, uh, these two lenses, because remember, it's 2.8 glass because you, you shoot a lot indoors, and therefore low light is a, is a relevant issue. Uh, many times you can't use a flash, but there's plenty of times when you'll want to have a flash. I mean, it varies, but there's, according to what you shoot, you may... Rarely use a flash, or you may use it almost all the time. Um, I have seen people who are on a budget, they have one body with a 24 to 120 f4. That's what you can do, and you got you know, everything else works, then that's what it is. Um, I've seen a number of photojournalists using Fuji bodies, which are APS C uh, crop sensor sized uh, bodies. They seem to all love them. Um, and uh, the only thing I can see downside, now of course, whether you like one camera system or another, that's one thing nothing to do with the size of the sensor, but the only compromise is that obviously smaller sensor means smaller pixels, means more noise and lower light. So there's a little bit of compromise in ISO, but I've seen multiple, especially in places which weren't very bright, using Fuji bodies, and they are thrilled with them. Um, I saw, I know at least one, I know two photographers using Olympus. This is an even smaller sensor. One has got, I think, physical uh, ability issues and, and a smaller lighter system for them you know, makes sense. The Fuji's are smaller, but this is even smaller. I know a couple using Leicas. Um, that's, uh, if you like it, that's great, but I'm not sure what the advantage is. Um, I know one guy using a speed graph, like a four by five, a working pro using that, and he's filing photos. Um, this, is, this is probably not where you should start, but you never know. Maybe this will set you apart. But remember, with a four by five, you can't, do, you can't be fast. You have to get the film developed, you know, and, you hope, and you, you're working slowly. You have to make sure that the shots count. Um, there's another guy with a, uh, David Burnett, a famous uh, photographer. He has a custom-built 4x5 camera, but he also has digital cameras he uses when appropriate. Um, I also know photographers that use small, fast primes, and they prefer that over zooms, and especially makes a small kit. You get a 35, 40, or 50 millimeter uh, f1.2 lens on a, small on a Fuji body or, or, or some of these other bodies. It's a really small light system, and 
they do fine. I've never seen a pro other than for social media posting use a smartphone and virtually no agency is gonna encourage you to do that. The only time that's acceptable would be if there's no other way to get the shot um, or there's a safety concern and you can't flash a, a, a fancy camera. Um, but uh, you'd be hard pressed to find someone in a media stand other than for social media immediate posting using smartphones. Although occasionally they get used, but um, don't count on that if that's what your uh, strategy is. Although I'm sure there's an exception to every rule. Um, you have to carry your equipment. Um, Photo backpack, put your name on it because there's, there's at least one company that seems dominant. So it'll be, is that mine or is that yours? Because they'll be identical. Uh, Think Tank Photo seems to be the dominant uh, purveyor of, of rolling cases and uh, the Shapeshifter series. So you'll find multiple in any media platform. So put your name on it. Um, a step stool, a one step stool. Well, I'll show you an example. We call them turtles. Um, a two-step ladder, or something we call a two-stepper, put your name on it, you'll see reasons later. Obviously batteries, card readers, um, label your laptop, don't worry about the card readers much. And you may be in range, you don't control it. Uh, Optech rain sleeves are cheap and effective and uh, small. Um, this is what a turtle looks like, 10 bucks or so in, at Amazon. Um, and there's different sizes. The 11 inch is nice because standing on it puts you over the person in front of you. That's usually enough to look over the person in front of you. And you could fit it, I could fit it into the 17 inch uh, laptop compartment in a, in a shape shifter, so it's easy to carry. The, seven, the 16 or higher is easier to sit on. The 11's a little low, I've done that, but the 16 is where people sit. And I, I, if you look carefully, I think I'll show you, uh, there were pictures where that, you saw exactly that. Um, this is a two step ladder on the left. Uh, as you can see, this is the White House. Um, the ladders get pretty tall, um, and it's a ladder war. And it's one of the reasons I like mirrorless because it's easy because it's also intended to shoot over the guy. I hold the camera up like this you know, over the guy in front of me or the woman in front of me. Um, that day I didn't get in front, but since the, the president doesn't always stop and talk to the press, I didn't miss out. You know, he just waved and went by, so it wasn't a big deal. I didn't miss out on anything. Um, but I went, I'm showing a two-step because other than at the White House, every other place a two-step is all you need probably. But at the White House, I realized I was being outgunned last summer, so I switched from a two to a three-step, and that's my three-stepper right in the front there. And you can't really read it, but my name's on the side of it. Um, this is a typical scene. We're being penned in at the Capitol for the impeachment trial. The Senate entrance to the chamber's on the right, and we're waiting for someone to walk by and take their picture. Um, and you can see the lower turtles on the right. And then there's the taller turtles for sitting. Then people could just stand. And then there's people. And then there's, a, there's an aluminum one also on the right where some people sit. And then there's two step ladders behind them. Um, and there's a guy standing on the left looking down. He's on a one step. He's on a typical turtle. So he's like they have like different levels, um, et cetera. And we're waiting for someone to come by. And we also have to all be in the pen in a few minutes. But until that point, it was pretty easy going. A mobile. You don't always get Wi-Fi, but you got a file. And you can't wait till you get home tonight or the next day. So a mobile hotspot's useful. According to what you shoot, other lenses are useful too. My first lens that I used commonly after the, the two I told you was a 300 8 because I'm at these political events, I'm far away, and it's dark. So I can't just use a super zoom because it's too small an aperture, and it's far. So a 300 8 um, I like for big heavy lenses, a monopod. Uh, because it's heavy, you can't just hold it forever, you know, 10 pounds and hold it steady, you know, for 150 feet away. And most people screw a monopod straight into the, the foot of a large lens. I like a head because instead of having to like tilt forward and back with a head, you could just tilt the camera forward and back because the monopod head goes in one direction. Uh, Manfrotto makes a very reasonably priced one. Um, rolling case for a large lens because stuff, the size and weight of what you're carrying adds up. It's plenty common to see a belt system with a third lens or batteries or, or, or other things you may need, a flash. Uh, microfiber cloths, for obvious reasons, you got something happens, dirt, dust, raindrops on your lens. And sometimes you're outdoors, I remember this the hard way. Now, now we all have smartphones that can light up and sort of light our way. But sometimes you're in venues that it's pitch black in the back. Especially if it's outdoors at night, there's no lighting in the media area. And you're trying to pack up and look for your stuff. So a headlamp is very convenient for doing that, or for working with the gear, you have like a, not having to hold it in one hand. Um, so let's talk DSLRs versus mirrorless. Um, DSLRs still beat out mirrorless for the most part, 
it's not, that's a generalization, in ability to grab focus in poor conditions, both the speed and its ability to grab focus quickly, which is relevant. These aren't still lifes we're generally shooting. Um, the Sony A9 uh, specifically is the only uh, mirrorless I think people think is on par. You know, like you're not giving up much by shooting with mirrorless in, in autofocus. Um, not that the other auto, uh, mirrorless cameras are bad, but that's the only one that's really, I think people consider you, they don't worry about not bringing the D5 or the 1DX Mark II uh, with. They're also smaller. They, they can be set to shoot silently, usually with electronic shutter and a mechanical. It's a different issue for what the different effects, good and bad, with shooting with a, silently. But that's in some venues, you don't want to be the one attracting undue attention because you're, you're making noise. Um, you also have live view shooting, which is instantaneous. And also, as I talked about before, you're shooting over the person in front of you and you're literally going like this to shoot. Or you're shooting very low down and you have the LCD aimed up because you don't, for some reason, you don't want to be on the ground or floor or it's, not or it's not practical. Or the person in front of you is there, so you put this like right by the shoulder or whatever. Um, and the future seems to be mirrorless. I mean, we're in a transition time. 10 years from now, I doubt you'll find too many DSLRs still for sale, although I, I could be wrong. You know, um, other issues. Your chances are you're not buying one camera, one lens, or two cameras, two lenses, and that's it, and you're never going to buy anything else. You're investing in a system. You're, going to, you're learning how to use the, learning the nuances of whether it's Canon, Nikon, or Sony, or Fuji, or whatever, of how they do things, how the menu's set up, how the controls are situated on the camera, and there's a way each camera system has a way of doing things. So you sort of want, you, you're not, you don't want to have to switch back and forth. So you want a system that has all the options you want. So certainly the ones, Canon, Nikon, Sony, for instance, for full frame, they make a wide range of equipment. Uh, third parties make a wide range of equipment. So you're not going to, you're going to have a great selection. Also, the bigger companies that have been around have better support in general. They've also been around and you know they're going to be around in the future. So there's longevity. You don't want to find, you know, Panasonic, which I have nothing against, make, made a phenomenal camera, but they didn't follow it up. And, um, you know, you want something that you have a sense will be there. I'm not saying picking up Panasonic, but you know, for instance, the Nikon Canon will certainly be there, as will probably Leica, I imagine. Um, you want a system where they keep up competitive, they may have a great camera today, but uh, they consistently over time come out with equipment that's competitive. Pixel count, lower is better usually for photojournalism, because if I'm shooting in low light, most, the, the top end Nikon Canon and Sony cameras are all 20 to 24 megapixels, even though they all make bigger, larger, um, cameras with more, uh, greater number of, me, me, of pixels, they, the pro cameras are, are lower pixels, number of pixels, because you're shooting in low light a lot, and you want low noise, and, that's, and 20, 24 is more than enough pixels to, uh, to get the, the image you want. It's not like you're shooting landscape and you're going to make you know, wall-sized photos generally out of this. It's more than enough for the news business. And of course, it depends on what your primary subject is. Um, you also want redundancy. You, you can't have the excuse, my camera broke. You know, now if, you, if, you're, if your car was stolen with the gear, all right, maybe they'll buy that. But your one camera breaking, that's not an excuse because you should have at least two. And um, some people are adamant on having dual memory cards. Um, that's your call. Um, I used to always have dual memory cards, but now I'm shooting Nikon mirrorless, which has one. And uh, fortunately, the XQDs are very reliable and I've never had a problem. But certainly dual memory cards is more reliable. So if you don't think you need high ISO, this is 3200 in the East Room. It's always dark there. Um, this is in the capital. It's, it's also not, it's some parts aren't too bright. It's not a TV studio there. And this is in the UN, in the General Assembly. They're not lighting it for me. They're lighting it for whatever, you know, the audience. And this is 5,000. And you, you probably don't see a lot of noise in there. And that's because I picked out a lower megapixel camera that performs well in low light. This is probably, I don't remember if this is a D5 or a Z6. But I mean, I purposely use lower megapixel cameras most of the time. Um, but I spend most of my time indoors at 1600, even in a TV studio, and they're practically noiseless. You know, the better modern, you know, the, the current crop of cameras. The major companies also have better, have formal support programs. Here are, the, here are four programs. You may be familiar with one or more of these. And typically, you, I mean, they all vary. Some of them are free. Um, some you pay for. Um, they all... And these are, they may include the following prioritize or discount to repair, sometimes free loaner equipment to try it out or for, for a special project. Um, you might get, if a new piece of equipment comes out, you'll, you'll get, if you are prioritized to get that piece of equipment before the general public. Uh, and at major events, they'll be there, they'll clean your camera, they'll loan you some uh, gear that you don't own. It's, it can be, you know, so there's, there's, there's some reasons. Insurance. 
Um, uh, theft, your homeowners is not gonna probably cover your camera gear unless you have a special rider for that. Um, also with the business you're in, it's not your personal, so you know, I don't know how that works. Um, if you rent gear, you want obviously some insurance because if you lose, something happens to the rental gear, you're probably responsible. Um, liability, um, and in general, you want health insurance if you're an independent. Um, where to buy it, NPPA has a program, PPA has a program, and there's a number of other companies, I think State Farm and some others have. Um, other skills that are useful to pick up, there's definitely people who shoot both stills and video. It's hard to do both at the same time well, but it certainly makes you more valuable. Um, sometimes you're, sh you're, you're, doing, you're going FTP straight from the camera to your client's FTP site, going through Wi-Fi or a mobile hotspot or a smartphone. Or you're transmitting to your smartphone or plugging into your smartphone, something with a card reader, I haven't successfully done that yet. And you edit on your smartphone and you transmit, they want an image, they want a couple images really fast from that event before they get the eventual, much better edited, carefully considered ones. Um, you may have to do portraits, so that, that's a relevant skill, and you may have opportunity to, use off, to do off-flash, uh, off-camera flash. Um, typical person at the stock market, because there's some story. Um, ethics, important. Um, NPA, PPA has a formal set of ethics, fairly straightforward, fairly reasonable. And I'm, again, mentioning image uh, manipulation. It's a no-no. It really will hurt your career if you're found to manipulate your image. And I mean, ads, adding things that aren't there, duplicating, you know, you found one puff of smoke is good, two puffs are better, you know, of, of the missile strike, as somebody did once and got in trouble, or deleting something that really there, like a wire running across. It, it, it's a no-no. You really um, could hurt your career. Um, so what I like about um, photojournalism is like I, I'm into politics and history and public policy. I get to witness things happening firsthand um, and get, make my own impression. I also get to go places I wouldn't get to go otherwise as a general member of the public and to see things. Um, and, and there is some variety, I mean, according to what you shoot. So dog, Westminster Dog Show is fun if you like dogs. It's actually a lot of fun if you like dogs. Um, get to go to the Iowa State Fair, and I would otherwise wouldn't hang out with the USA Pork Queen, as Pete Buttigieg flips uh, some pork, you know, to try to, you know, get votes. Um, Fourth of July, you know, yoga, um, protests. Um, I, I would get this kind of view at the, at the General Assembly. They don't have the general public in to the General Assembly when they're meeting. So I, I mean, I get to go and see things. 9-11, um, uh, fireworks, and by having a press pass, I got actually a pretty good location for that uh, July 4th. Uh, this is New York City. You can see Chrysler building on the right. Um, and then there's, of course, you know, just somber events. They need a picture. There's like a pictorial, so like a, an intro, a picture to illustrate the concept of, you know, Memorial Day or Veterans Day or something like that. And you do red carpets, and I get closer to movie stars than I probably would ever in my life otherwise get. So that's sort of, sort of fun. Or, or just general pictures of New York, because I love New York. 